Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 27. In this part, I'm going to talk about potential and kinetic energy with a variable gravitational force. In the previous part, I used g as a constant gravitational acceleration. Here I want to bring in Newton's gravitational law with the force and thus the acceleration changes inversely with the distance from the center of the gravitational force. Near the surface of the Earth, gravitational force equals mass times g, and g equals minus 9.81 meters per second squared. I want to first derive the acceleration g from Newton's law of gravitation. Newton's universal law of gravitation states that the gravitational force all equals minus g times m1m2 over r squared. Everything except r is a constant in this equation for the Earth. So f the force is a function of the distance r and is proportional to 1 over r squared. According to Newton's second law, f equals ma, m2 thus equals, m2a thus equals minus gm1m2 over r squared, and I substituted m2 for m. The m2 is canceled, and I'm left with an equation for acceleration, and here I substituted a capital M for m1. This is the formula for acceleration for an Earth mass where r equals the radius of the Earth, hence this is acceleration at the surface of the Earth. Big G is the gravitational constant. It equals 6.693 times 10 to the minus 11th. The mean radius of the Earth is 6.383 times 10 to the 6 meters. The radius of the Earth varies depending on where you are, so this is an approximate value. The mass of the Earth is 5.95 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. And if I plug in those numbers, I get minus 9.81 meters per second squared for acceleration when r is the distance from the center of the Earth to the surface, which is the Earth's radius. In the last part, I showed you an animation where a ball traveled about 250 meters up and then fell back to the Earth. Here's the gravitational ex equation for acceleration 250 meters above the Earth. And note that the denominator is the radius of the Earth plus 250. Here I'm substituting in g, mass of the Earth and radius of the Earth. At 250 meters above the surface of the Earth, the acceleration goes down by only about 0.001 meters per second squared. Not enough to notice unless you're measuring very precisely. The simulation I showed you in the last part started with an initial velocity of 70 meters per second. The ball reached an apex of almost 250 meters. And in my computations, I used a constant gravitational acceleration, which works in that case. It's at least a very close approximation. Let's take the case that's 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, or 1 times 10 to the 6th meters. Here I've added 1 times 10 to the 6th meters to the radius of the Earth. Here I fill in all the constants, and that equals 7.33 meters per second squared, which is a big difference from 9.81 meters per second squared. So if you travel 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, you'll feel less acceleration. Here's the formula for potential energy. Here's the same formula with minus gm over r squared substituted for g. And here I'm substituting r for h. h was the height from an arbitrary zero point. r is the distance from the center of the Earth. <clears throat> There's an r in both the numerator and denominator, so I can simplify this to u equals gm m earth over r. I change the m1 and m2 variables to little m and big M. Little m is the mass of the smaller object. Big M is the mass of the planet, which is Earth in this case. G is a constant, and if we're considering the Earth as a central mass, then m is 2. To make things simple, I'll use 1 kilogram as the mass of the small object. That ends up equaling 3.996 times 10 to the 14th over r, and that's a negative number. If r equals the radius of the Earth, then the potential energy at the surface is minus 6.262 times 10 to the 7th. At 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, the potential energy is minus 5.414 times 10 to the 7th. The limit as r approaches infinity of gmm over r equals 0 since r goes to infinity in the denominator. That means the gravitational potential energy is zero at infinity. So infinity is the zero reference point. That's the convention for gravitational energy. If a rolling ball is on ramps, the zero point for potential energy could be any arbitrary point, like the horizontal section. 
In a gravitational field, however, we set the zero point at infinity. Everything below that, and that's literally everything, is negative. Hence, gravitational potential energy is always negative. In orbital dynamics, the magnitude of the gravitational force varies over an elliptical orbit. The gravitational force is stronger at the periapsis point and weaker at the apoapsis point. A constant acceleration g is okay for local trajectories. It won't work for orbits. I want to quantify uh, work over a region with a variable force. And in order to do that, I'll, I'll need to use some calculus. So let me set this up first. Suppose I have a rocket traveling up against a variable gravitational force that's pulling it, wanting to pull it down. I know from Newton's gravitational equation that the force at r, f of r, equals minus gmm over r squared. I now want to compute the work required to get the object from a point A to a point B. If the force were constant, then I'd simply compute the displacement from A to B, which equals h, and multiply that by the force, f. For a variable force, let's pick a point r and then a point delta r away from that. And if that delta r is small enough, I can make a reasonable estimate of the work from r um, to r plus delta r by multiplying the force times the displacement, delta r. The total work performed is the work at r plus delta r minus the work at r. And if I combine those into one equation, I can divide both sides by delta r to get this. And then if I take the limit of um, w plus r plus w of r plus delta r minus wr over delta r, that is the derivative of w of r with respect to r. And this is pretty basic calculus. The limit of the equation on the left is defined in derivative calculus to be the derivative. So this implies that the force is the derivative of work. And here's that in simple notation. If the force is the derivative of work, then work is the integral of force. That's the fundamental theorem of calculus, or at least one of the theorems. Newton's law of gravitation already gave me the instantaneous force at in any given point r. The integral gives me the total work performed over a range of r values. So if I wanted to determine the work performed from point A to point B, I'd use this integral. Here's the formula for variable force. I'll substitute this in the integral. And notice I didn't include the negative sign. This is positive work, like uh, the work that a rocket would do. If I want to compute the work performed on an object by gravity, I take the integral from B to A, and then the function would be negative. In order for the rocket to lift uh, from the surface of the Earth, the force on the rocket would have to be greater than the force of gravity. If it's less, the rocket would lay way less, but wouldn't rise up. For simplicity, let's assume the rocket is launched straight out on a spherical Earth that's not rotating. The force F sub rocket and displacement will be in the same direction, and it'll be in line with the gravitational force. And let's also assume that the force is applied instantaneously. We can never do this in reality, but for the purposes of this derivation, I'm going to assume that. I also need to assume there's no atmosphere. Atmospheric drag is a non-conservative force that would slow the uh, rocket down on its ascent and would also slow it down on its descent. So here I want to solve that integral. Here's the starting point at one Earth radius from the center, which is the surface of the Earth. I'll pick a point out in, spa out in space that's a distance r sub f from the center of the Earth. My aim is to propel the rocket out to this point, and from there, let it drop back to the Earth. The gravitational force at r sub f will be minus gmm Earth over r sub f squared. And that'll be less than the force at the surface of the Earth. Here's the integral of the rocket force from the surface of the Earth to r sub f. This will equal the work performed on the rocket. I'll substitute gmm over r squared for f sub rocket like I did in the previous slide. gm and m Earth are constant, so I can take those out of the integral. The integral of 1 over r squared is minus 1 over r. And let me derive that for you. So you recall from calculus that the derivative of x to the n is n times x to the n minus 1. 1 over r equals r to the minus 1. Hence, the derivative of r to the minus 1 is minus minus 1 times r to the minus 1 minus 1. And that equals r to the minus 2, which is 1 over r squared. 
So the antiderivative of 1 over r squared is minus 1 over r. To solve the integral, I evaluate minus 1 over r at r earth and r sub f. That's minus 1 over r sub f minus minus 1 over r sub earth. And that simplifies to gmm earth times 1 over r earth minus 1 over r sub f. And that's the formula I'll use to compute the work. There's something interesting here I want to show you. If I multiply both terms by GMM Earth again, the formulas are the potential energy at the surface of the Earth minus the potential energy at the distant point R sub F. And I'm showing you that here. So this makes sense since the work is the difference in since work is the difference in potential energy. With this equation, I can equate that with the difference in kinetic energies. For the law of conservation of energy, the total work is either the difference in potential energies or the difference in kinetic energies. At R sub F, the optic is momentarily at rest and then falls back down to Earth. Hence, the kinetic energy at R sub F is zero. That means that the kinetic energy at the surface of the Earth at the launching point is equal to the difference in potential energy. This makes intuitive sense. The rocket has to have a certain amount of kinetic energy at the start to get to R sub F. Here's the formula I derived on the last slide. K equals 1 half mv squared. If I solve for v squared, then v squared equals 2k over the mass m. I'll substitute gmm times 1 over R sub Earth minus 1 over R sub F for k. The small m's cancel. If I take the square root, I get this. The velocity is plus or minus. It's positive on the way up and negative on the way down. And with this formula, I can determine how much velocity is required to get to R sub F. Here I want to show you an example using the formula I just derived to calculate an initial velocity that will get a rocket 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. So here's the formula I derived for the initial velocity that you need to impart at the surface to reach a distance R sub F. And then here are all the constants, g, radius of the Earth, mass of the Earth. All right, so I'll start with this equation for velocity. I'll set r sub f to be 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. That equals 7.383 times 10 to the 6 meters. And here I plugged in all the values. The difference between the two fractions on the right is 2.122 times 10 to the minus 8. And if I multiply all these terms, I get 1.696 times 10 to the 7th. And then if I take the square root of that, I get 4,118.7 meters per second. So if at the surface of the Earth, the rocket achieved an instantaneous velocity of 4,118.7 meters per second, the rocket would go up 1,000 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, hover for an instant at the apex, and then fall back down to Earth. At the apex, there's no kinetic energy. There is potential energy. Um, and then when the rocket falls back down to the Earth, it'll regain all this kinetic energy, and again, we'll be traveling at 4,118.7 meters per second. And again, this assumes a lot of things that are not true for the Earth. It's a non-rotating Earth. The rocket, rocket launches straight up, and there's no atmosphere. And in reality, this wouldn't be the case. This formula works for any starting point and any finish point. So if the rocket started at 500 kilometers above the surface of the Earth and you wanted to get it to 1,000 kilometers above the surface, at that point it would need to be traveling at a velocity of 2,804.5 meters per second. And you can think of this another way. If the rocket had achieved a velocity of 4,118.7 meters per second at the surface of a non-rotating Earth with no atmosphere, the velocity would be 2,804.5 meters when it reached the halfway point. And yet another way of looking at this, which is more practical, is don't worry about achieving the 4,118.7 meter per second of instantaneous velocity at the surface. Get the rocket out of the atmosphere more slowly. And as you get it up to 5,000 kilometers of altitude, Increase the velocity, do whatever it takes to increase the velocity to 2,804.5 meters per second. And from that point, it'll reach the desired altitude. And from that point, um, you won't need any additional acceleration.
So let's say I wanted to know the velocity at the surface of the Earth that the rocket would have to travel to escape completely from Earth's gravity. In that case, I set the outer radius r sub f to infinity. And here's the formula for velocity. If I want to escape Earth's velocity, then r sub f would be infinity and thus 1 over r sub f would be 0. I'll make that substitution and that simplifies to this. Here I plugged in all the constants and that equals 11.19 kilometers per second. So if you launch a rocket at the surface of the Earth at that velocity, it will escape, Earth, escape Earth's orbit. If you were to start at a distance that tw is twice the radius of the Earth, then the calculation would look like this. Note the two in the denominator. That equals 7.91 kilometers per second. Hence, you can apply thrust more slowly, get yourself out to one Earth radius beyond the surface of the Earth, and then escape velocity would be 7.91 kilometers per second. And again, another way to look at this is if you were to leave the Earth at 11.19 kilometers per second, you'd be traveling at 7.91 kilometers per second by the time you reach one Earth radius in altitude. 11.19 kilometers per second is enough velocity to escape Earth orbit, but what about the Sun? Here's the radius of the Sun and mass. Escape velocity from the surface of the Sun is 618.55 kilometers per second substantially higher than Earth escape velocity. If you're escaping from the Earth, however, you're not that close to the Sun. The distance at Earth aphelion to the Sun is 1.5 to 1 times 10 to the 11th meters. So I'd want to compute the solar escape velocity from that point and assume we're doing this in early July when the Earth orbit is at aphelion. That velocity is 41.83 kilometers per second. So 11.19 kilometers per second will get you out of Earth's gravity, but if that's as fast as you go, you'd then enter a solar orbit. If you want to exit the solar system, you'd have to go 41.83 kilometers per second. I'm now going to show you some Python code that will simulate motion with a variable gravitational acceleration. In order to do this, I need an estimation algorithm that I'll show you here. And I did something like this in part 13. Here's the equation for position where P0 is the initial position, V0 is the initial velocity, and G is constant gravitational acceleration. And you recall from part 13 that the integral of 1 half gt squared is velocity times time, and the integral of velocity times time is position, and that's how I derive P equals P0 plus V0t plus 1 half gt squared. For variable acceleration, I'd substitute minus gmm over r squared for G, sadly, I can't integrate this function. So I have to resort to an estimation technique. Velocity is the derivative of position and acceleration is the derivative of velocity. That means the integral of velocity is position and the integral of acceleration is velocity. Note that when you take the integral of something, you end up with both the antiderivative function and the constant. So P0 is the initial position and V0 is the initial velocity. I'll estimate the change in position from point A to point B by taking a very small integral from t to t plus dt of v. I can approximate that by starting with the initial position p at a and then adding the velocity at a times dt, the small delta time. If I choose dt to be small enough, it's a pretty good approximation. I'll do the same thing for velocity. I'd start with the velocity at a and then add the acceleration a at a times dt. If I want to know the position at some time, tn, I'd start with the initial position, and then I'd add all the velocities times delta t from t0 to tn. In this summation, each of the velocities I'm summing would be different. dt is a constant, and it equals tn plus 1 minus tn. I complete the velocity in a similar way by starting with initial velocity and summing all the variable accelerations for each dt between t0 and tn. And if you recall, that's essentially what an integral does, except with instantaneous functions. Now, instead of using this constant acceleration, I'd use this equation with these constants. And since I'm simulating things leaving the surface of the Earth, I'll set up r to equal the radius of the Earth. So p0 will equal the radius of the Earth. Acceleration at any given position, Pn, will equal this. Velocity at time T1 is V0 plus AT1 times dt. Velocity at time T2 is the velocity at 
uh, V at T1 plus um, acceleration at T2 times DT. And then position would equal P0 plus, at position at time T1 would equal P0 plus VT1 times DT. At position at time T2 would likewise be at the position at T1 plus VT2 times delta T. So what I just described is what these summations are depicting. And this may look complicated mathematically, algebraically. It's much simpler when you'll see it in Python code in a minute. You might ask what happened to the one half factor in the third term of this equation. And I had that same question myself. If you choose a delta time, dt small enough, then a good approximation of the new velocity is the old velocity plus acceleration times the small delta time. Likewise, a good approximation of position is the old position plus the velocity times the small delta time. These are approximations, so they aren't perfect. And like I said a second ago, we can't use integral calculus to derive closed form equations for um, these kind of equations. Here I'll show you the Python code that will simulate an object traveling at escape velocity. So I'll call this kinematics animation and I'm going to bring in matplotlib as a library. And then this is the basic structure of a matplotlib animation where there's an animation call and then you need an animate function within that. And here I'm just setting the font size and setting up a figure. Here's the gravitational constant. Here's the radius of the Earth. Here's the mass of the Earth. And the mass of the object I'm going to have travel at escape velocity is one kilogram. The initial position is going to be the surface of the Earth, the radius of the Earth. The initial velocity is going to be escape velocity, and that's the formula for escape velocity. And the acceleration at the surface is g m e over r squared. This is the initial potential energy at the surface of the Earth and the initial kinetic energy at escape velocity. And then this is the total energy, which is simply potential plus kinetic energy. This is a time vector I'll use for plotting. And then the delta time is going to be an increment of 20. I need a T max to scale the time plot. So it's just 1500 times DT and H top to scale the position plots. All right, this is the position, position graph where I'm going to plot the point. And that's going to be on the left-hand side and run the whole vertical length. And then the vertical position plot is going to plot all the position points. Um, and that'll be on the right. And then the position vector is what I plot versus time. So it's going to start at P0. Here's the velocity plot. And that's going to plot the velocity vector, which starts at V0. And here's the acceleration plot. And because acceleration is variable, the acceleration vector is going to start with A0. And then here's the energy plot, and it's going to plot total energy, kinetic energy, and potential energy, three lines. And the initial energy is E0, the initial kinetic energy is K0, and the initial potential energy is U0. And then I need to set these up as global variables so I can pass them in and out of the animate function. And here's how I set up time. I just multiply i, the input to the animate function, times dt. And then I need to append that time to the time vector. So I can plot position, velocity, acceleration versus time. And then I'm going to grab the last known position from the position vector. So it starts at p0, and then I'm going to add elements to it as I go. And then the first thing I'm going to do is compute acceleration. A equals minus GME over R squared. And I'm using that R up there. Then I compute velocity. And this is using the approximation. Velocity is the last velocity plus acceleration times delta time. And I'm going to append that to the velocity vector. Now here's a more accurate way to do that. And I'll show you that there's a bit of a discrepancy with these estimations. And then 
P is um, R the position times the velocity up there times delta time dt. And again, this is a straight line approximation. And then I add that to the uh, position vector as well as replot the point. And now I'm going to recompute kinetic energy. K equals mv squared based on that v. And now that's the vector. I'm going to uh, compute potential energy based on r, which is the point up here. Now you could argue I probably should use p, but I want to use r and v because they're consistent. And then the total energy is e. Uh, it's just u, u plus k. And then I need to return all these values in order to plot them. And that's basically it. It's pretty simple. So if I execute this, now notice how quickly the acceleration falls off. So as the object gains altitude, uh, one of our squared says that the acceleration falls off pretty precipitously. And then look at the kinetic versus potential energy graph. It's converging on zero, which you would expect. And of course, velocity is going down to zero position is ever increasing. Not quite linear, but kind of that way. And the initial energy was zero, but look what happened with the E vector. It Because of the approximations, the straight line approximations, energy actually went negative. And so if I use this method to compute velocity right here, which is essentially just recomputing velocity, I, I get a more accurate number. This is still an approximation. It's not perfect, but it's pretty close and you can kind of get a feel for the dynamics. So now energy is indeed pegged at zero. And even though there was a discrepancy, you couldn't see it in the graph, but the last um, element of the, of the energy vector is equal to zero exactly. All right, so for comparison purposes, Let's say I make the initial velocity two times the escape velocity. So here, the object's going to go to infinity and beyond. And you can see acceleration drops off more quickly. Kinetic energy and potential energy do as well. And here, E0 is a positive number. And that makes sense. If um, the velocity is higher than escape velocity, then uh, energy would be positive. Now I'm going to do one half escape velocity. And you can see the acceleration doesn't drop off as quickly. And if I check energy, it's now negative. And so this would be a bound trajectory. This would be ultimately an orbit. So I want to do some simple algebra to confirm that escape velocity, the total energy is zero. Here is the Earth escape velocity I computed earlier. K equals one half mv squared and u equals gmm over r. And so I can make those substitutions in the energy equation. And here I'm substituting the square root of two gmm over r for v. Um, since v is squared, I can get rid of the radical, um, and the one half and the two cancel. And then I can move little m into the fraction, and these two terms are identical. And thus, if you're at escape velocity, the total energy is zero. I've accounted for a variable force, but it was a downward, downward force in a straight line in the direction of motion. Here I'll show you how to account for compound motion where the force is not in line with the direction of motion or the velocity vector. This is how things occurred in Galileo's experiments using ramps where the force of gravity was not in line with the velocity of the ball. This is important for orbital dynamics since the gravitational force that keeps the satellite bound in its orbit is never aligned with its velocity. If the gravitational force and velocity are aligned, it means the object is going to crash into the Earth. In fact, you recall that at apoapsis and periapsis, the for forces are orthogonal to the velocity. Galileo rolled the ball on an incline and an angle theta. Assume the ball has mass m. The force of gravity is the mass times g, or mg. That's what causes the ball to roll downhill, 
Let's now call the displacement vector R. Since this is straight line motion, the velocity of the ball goes along this displacement vector. This is the height of the ball as it rolls down the incline, and here's the vertical displacement vector P. When Galileo lifted the ball to the start, he went, against, he went against the force of gravity, mg. Work is force times displacement, hence the work performed here is f times p. Strictly speaking, the displacement vector is r, but r is not aligned with the downward gravitational force vector, f. I'm going to resolve that in a minute. Potential energy, by convention, is mgh, expressed in this equation. I'll define u at the top to be the zero point. Since the ball is falling, P will be an increasing negative number. Since the force F equals mg, work W equals mgp. As the ball rolls down the incline, H will decrease. Hence, when the ball rolls down the incline, the work will be negative. This makes sense since the ball is losing potential energy. P and R form a right triangle with R as the hypotenuse. So the cosine of theta is the length of the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. That's P over R. P thus equals R cosine theta. And I can make that a substitution in the work equation. Now recall that the dot product of two vectors are their magnitudes times the cosine of the angle between them. Hence the dot product of the vectors g and r is the magnitude of g times the magnitude of r times the cosine of theta. The work equation can be expressed in this way, m times g dot r. Mass times the gravity vector is the force vector. I can make that substitution. The work performed by the force vector f is the dot product of the force vector and the displacement vector. This is a more general way to express work and allows for displacement that's not in line with the force vector. The instantaneous force is the change in work over an infinitesimally small change in position, dr. The derivative of work with respect to the vector r is the force vector. The small amount of work over the displacement dr is expressed in this way. dw equals the force vector times the small interval dr. This is a dot product, f dot dr. If you want to know the total work between two points, a and b, you take the integral of f dot dr from a to b. The integral of the derivative of work is simply w, the underlying function. Hence, w is the integral from a to b of the force vector with respect to the position vector r. Now I want to use a formalism to characterize motion along a curved path. Orbits and gravitational trajectories don't typically go along straight lines. So let's say the displacement goes from A to B. The integral must take into account both the force and the variable path. It turns out this is trivial with vectors. I use the same vector notation F for all the forces. They vary over time, however, so they're not the same vector. That means there's some function F of R that quantifies the force in any given displacement. You can see where I'm going with this. Newton's gravitational equation is a function of r. On the previous slide, I used the position vector r that only went in one direction. Here, I'll have the vector vary in magnitude and direction. The position vector r will vary over time. r of t defines the displacement vector over time and ultimately gets you from a to b. If there isn't a simple formula for R, I can do something like express it in terms of the univectors i, j, and k, and there's other univectors as well. I can expre also express uh, components of the univector R as, um, I can express this in components of the univector R and the univector theta. For what I'm doing here, I don't need to bother with that. Here I just want to deal with a vector function R and a variable, variable force vector that varies um, as R varies. On the previous slide, I showed you that the total work performed from A to B is the integral from point A to B of f dot dr. That holds for this curve path, too. This is now a contour integral. The integration takes place along the curve. Since motion takes place over time, I'll make R a parametric equation. The position A is R at time ta. Likewise, the position B is R at time tb. With that, I can express the integral in terms of time. I do that by substituting r of t for r and then adding dt over dt. In calculus, this must follow the chain rule. It accounts for the fact that r of t is also a function. This integral would be wrong. I can express this more simply as the integral from time a to b of the force vector f dot dr dt dt. dr dt is the change of position over time, which equates to the velocity because 
the derivative of position is velocity. I can make that substitution. The total work is the integral of the dot product of force and velocity over time. This is just different notation. It uses Newton's dot notation. R dot implies the derivative over time. Here's how you express the integral with dot notation. While this notation is not as versatile, you'll see it frequently. I prefer the Leibniz notation. This formula can now be expressed this way. The first formula gives me work over distance. The second is work over time. In orbital dynamics, we prefer to do this over time. Here's a notional elliptical orbit. Here's the force vector, and here's the velocity vector. And you can see they're not co-aligned. In part eight, I derived a formula for an ellipse. The algebra was complex, and the resultant formula wasn't that intuitive. With vector calculus, this got, gets much more intuitive. With all that I've shown you, I can now formalize the law of conservation of energy. This accounts for variable forces and variable displacements, so it's the general case. I'll start with the integral of the vector form of the work equation, where work W equals the integral of the dot product of the force vector F and the velocity vector V over time dt. Force equals mass times acceleration, and acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Hence, force equals mass times dV dt. I can make that substitution. Force thus equals m dV dt. I can make that substitution here. You'll recall that V dot V equals the scalar V squared. Hence, d squared dt equals d dt of v dot v. With dot products, the derivative of a dot b is a dot db dt plus da dt dot b. Hence, the derivative of v dot v is v dot db dt plus db dt dot v. Since a dot b equals b dot a, I can combine these terms. Now, if I divide divide both sides of this equation by 2, I get 1 half d dt of v squared equals v dv dt. I can make that substitution in the integral for work. If I rearrange terms, I get this. Notice that the formula for kinetic energy just appeared in this equation. Notice, too, that I'm taking the integral of a derivative. Here's the integral for work from time a, time t a to t b that accounts for motion between the points A and B. The second fundamental, fundamental theorem of calculus says that the integral of a derivative is the underlying function. So the integral equals the function 1 half mv squared from the time at A and the time at B. This then expands out to 1 half mv squared at time TB minus 1 half mv squared at time TA. Early on this, in this part, I derived equations for kinetic energy based on the state of a rolling ball at the start and end. That offered conveniences since kinetic energy was zero at the start and potential energy was zero at the end. I told you, however, that that didn't prove that kinetic energy was 1 half mv squared in between. Here, 1 half mv squared fell out of the equation, and by convention, we call this k. If kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, then this equals the kinetic energy at B minus the kinetic energy at A. Going back to the integral for work from A to B, it equals the integral of F dot dr from A to B or F dot dB dt from time A to time B. And that equals the kinetic energy at B minus the kinetic energy at A. And that equals Kb minus Ka. In the case of a body falling vertically in a uniform gravitational field falling vertically with uniform acceleration, the work done with the negative gravitational potential energy difference is minus UB minus UA. The work done by gravity lowers this potential energy. Hence, KB minus KA equals minus UB minus UA. I can reverse UB minus UA and then add KA to both sides and UB to both sides. If I do a little bit of rearranging, I get this. This is the law of conservation of energy. The sum of the potential and kinetic energy at one point equals the sum at another point. And if they're equal at any two points, the sum is a constant. Now by convention, I can tell you this function that was the integral for work k, since it's a function of velocity, it's an equation of motion, hence this is kinetic energy. And from the start, I define potential energy as the mass times force times displacement. And MGR was always defined 
of the entire range of motion. Now, 1 half mv squared is as well. I want to now relate this all back to elliptical orbits and orbital trajectories. In parts 8, 9, and 10, I developed equations for the proper motion of a planet or satellite in orbit around a central body. It follows an elliptical path. According to Kepler's second law, the velocity at apoapsis is slower than at periapsis. Since there is no net force acting on the orbiting body outside of the gravitational force from the central body, the energy of the orbiting system is conserved. U plus K must equal a constant throughout the orbit. In the case of potential energy, U equals minus GMM over R, where little m is the mass of the satellite and big M is the mass of the central body. We're assuming here that big M is much bigger than little m. As the distance from the central body increases, like at apoapsis, the potential energy increases. As R gets larger, one of R gets smaller. Likewise, as the distance from the central body decreases, like a periapsis, the potential energy decreases. The kinetic energy must increase to compensate. Thus, the satellite must move faster. In the animation, as the satellite gets near the Earth, the velocity has to increase to account for the loss of potential energy. The kinetic energy increases with the velocity squared. Looked at the other way, the velocity squared increases so that it accounts for the loss of potential energy. We'll delve more into this later when um, I characterize the energy of an orbit, which I'm about to do right now. So I want to relate conic section-based trajectories to energy. I'll start with this case in the middle. This is where the yellow object leaves the red object at escape velocity, so the initial velocity will be the escape velocity. And I compute that from the equation I derived earlier. You know from these calculations that the total energy is zero. And here is what that looks like. Since this object goes to infinity, the maximum potential energy will be zero. That's where R um, the distance equals infinity. If the potential energy goes to zero, then the kinetic energy at infinity must be zero since the total energy is zero. That means the velocity goes to zero at infinity. And you saw this simulated, although I didn't run it to infinity. Before reaching zero, the velocity gets really, really small. Hence, it takes an infinite amount of time for the object to get there. If both the potential and kinetic energy at infinity are zero, then in general, k plus u equals zero based on the law of conservation of energy. This also implies that the kinetic energy equals minus potential energy. And because potential energy is negative up to the infinity point, then kinetic energy is always positive. Here's the case where the initial velocity is less than escape velocity. That means that the yellow object will travel out and then will come back into the red sphere. The maximum potential energy will be less than zero since this object can never reach infinity. If there's less kinetic energy than the first middle case, then the total energy must be less than zero. That means the kinetic energy is less than minus u. This makes sense. If you want to reach escape velocity, the kinetic energy must be equal to minus u. Anything less will cause the yellow object to travel back. Hence, in this case, the total energy is less than zero. If the initial velocity is greater than escape velocity, then the yellow object will travel to infinity and beyond. The maximum potential energy will be greater than zero. This may not make sense. It's true that mathematically, practically, you can't go beyond infinity. But you also can't get to infinity. It would take an infinite amount of time to get there. Hence, this is all hypothetical. The total energy of this system is greater than zero. That implies that the kinetic energy is greater than minus u which means there's a net positive energy. The case where energy equals zero or is greater than zero sounds nonsensical, but only at the extremes. They make sense locally. These cases are nonsensical at the extremes, but only because we define the zero potential energy point at infinity, which doesn't exist. What I like about this is that a bound orbit has negative energy and an unbound trajectory has greater than or equal to zero energy. If I were to give the yellow object some initial velocity that's not directed at the red central body, the trajectory would look like this. This is an elliptical orbit, which means the eccentricity E is less than 1. Hence, in order for a satellite to orbit in a bound elliptical orbit, the total energy of the orbiting system must be less than 0. If the energy equals 0, then the trajectory is not bound. It's parabolic. Uh, 
which means E equals 1. I haven't proven that yet. I will in a moment. If the energy is greater than 0, the trajectory is hyperbolic, which means E is greater than 1. And like I said, I'll prove that in a minute. So in part 25, I showed that a body in motion under the influence of gravity will move along a conic section. A parabola is where the eccentricity of the trajectory shape is 1, and that equates to an energy equal to 0. An ellipse is where the eccentricity of the trajectory is less than 1, and that equates to an energy that is less than 0. A circle has eccentricity of 0. That's a special case of an ellipse. It doesn't have a unique energy level. A hyperbola is where the eccentricity is greater than 1, and its energy is greater than 0. So there's a relationship between energy and eccentricity. But before I get to that, I want to point out that for escape velocity, it doesn't matter which direction the object travels. This animation shows vertical motion, and that would look like this. If the object were launched in a different direction, the path would be parabolic. The object still goes to infinity, but this time along a parabolic path. So what if the object were to go something like this? You have to think of the central body as a point mass. The trajectory is going to be with respect to that point mass. The parabola will have a different shape, but it will still be a parabola. Something else I want to point out deals with parabolic motion. In part 13, I talked about the law of falling bodies. There I described local parabolic motion. In this part, however, I've said the parabolic motion is an unbound trajectory. In part 13, objects were launched into, a seemingly, into seemingly parabolic trajectories and return to the Earth. That means their energies had to be less than zero. The motions of objects on Earth are not really parabolic. Strictly speaking, they're the top part of an ellipse. If you were to condense the Earth down to a point mass, the object would rise to an apex in a seemingly parabolic trajectory, but then would orbit around the point mass. The point mass would be at the other focus in the ellipse. Hence, you're not really observing parabolic motion. A parabola is an approximation. What you're really observing is motion along an elliptical shape. I derived this formula in the last part, part 25, where L is the angular momentum. I derived this equation along the way. So let me solve for V of the velocity vector. I divided both sides of this equation by L, the angular velocity, and then multiplied by GMM. I can multiply both sides of this equation by itself to get this. This wasn't standard multiplication. I used the dot product on both sides. V dot V is the scalar V squared. I can factor out the constants G, M, M over L. I can then expand out the dot product of theta hat plus E, J hat dot theta hat plus E, J hat. Theta hat dot theta hat is 1 since theta hat's a unit vector and 1 squared is 1. Theta hat dot j hat is cosine theta, so 2 theta dot e j is 2 e cosine theta. I can make that substitution. e j hat dot e j hat is e squared times j hat dot j hat, and since j is a unit vector, j hat dot j hat is 1. I can make that substitution. Kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared, and this equals v squared. Hence, K equals 1 half M GMM over L squared times 1 plus 2E cosine theta E squared. Here I'm squaring everything in the parentheses individually, and now I'm combining everything into one fraction, and that results in this. This is the formula for kinetic energy. This is a function of eccentricity and the angle theta. I showed you in the last part the angular momentum of an orbiting body is constant, so L is a constant. So you can see where I'm going with this. I'm starting to introduce eccentricity into these formulas so I can relate eccentricity to energy. And I've already done that somewhat in um, a formula that where k is a function of eccentricity e. OK, let me deal with u now. Potential energy u equals gmm over r. I'll make one of r separate. 1 over r equals gm squared m 1 plus e cosine theta over l squared. And um, 
I just flip the denominator and the numerators in the previous equation. Substituting that for one over r gives me this. Now again, I'm combining all the constants and I'll multiply by two over two. So here's an equation for potential energy that's a function of eccentricity in the angle theta. And here's the formula for kinetic energy I just derived. All right, so if you stay with me, this will get a little, this will get clearer in the next slide. So remember that the total energy equals kinetic plus potential energies. K plus U is this. The fraction G squared M cubed M over 2L squared is common to both terms. So that can come out. And then if I get rid of the internal, oh, that comes out there. And then I'll get rid of the internal parentheses. And the last 2E cosine theta becomes minus 2E cosine theta. Um, and then I can reduce this a lot. Inside the parentheses, there's a 1 and a minus 2. That results in minus 1. There's also a 2E cosine theta and a minus 2E cosine theta. So those cancel, which means I lose theta. So total energy equals G squared M cubed M squared over 2L squared times E squared minus 1. So theta has been eliminated. Um, you need theta to determine kinetic energy and potential energy individually but it's not a function of the total energy, which makes sense. The only variable in this equation is E. So I, I now have an equation that equates energy to eccentricity. An object following a path defined by a conic section has an energy E, angular momentum of L, and a constant value um, defined by G squared times M cubed times M squared. With this equation for energy, we can solve for eccentricity E. First, I want to multiply both sides of this equation by 2L squared, and then divide both sides by G squared, M cubed, M squared. And from here, from here I can add 1 to both sides. The eccentricity equals 1 plus 2L squared E over G squared, M cubed, M squared. If the total energy E is 0, then the term on the right side of this sum is multiplied by 0, which makes it 0. And that leaves the square root of 1, which equals 1. Hence, if the total energy is 0, eccentricity must equal 1. So I just proved that. If the energy is greater than 0, then E will be a positive number. And I depict that as a plus E in this equation. So eccentricity will be 1 plus some positive number. And even if you take the square root of that, it'll be greater than 1. If the total energy is less than 0, then the energy in this term will be less than zero. It'll be a negative number. And one minus some number will be less than one. And thus, after you take the square root of that, the eccentricity will be less than one. So here I just proved the relationship between energy and eccentricity. If I rearrange terms for the equation of energy, I can express as E, I can express E as GMM over two times GM squared M over L squared times E squared minus one. In the last part, I said that L squared over GM squared M was equal to A times one minus E squared. I can flip the denominators with the numerators and then I can make that substitution. E squared minus one equals minus one minus E squared. The minus 1 e squared is canceled, and I'm left with gmm0 over 2a. I did something like this before. This expresses the total energy in terms of the mass of the object, the mass of the central body m, and the semi-major axis of the orbit. This is an important conclusion. Since gm and m are constant, the magnitude of the energy of the orbit is a function of the semi-major axis. In this case, for a non-zero semi-major axis, the energy is always negative. Hence, this applies only to an eccentric orbit. For a parabolic orbit, the semi-major axis is infinity. That makes the total energy zero. This equation doesn't make a lot of sense for a hyperbolic orbit. Here I want to explain how energy is proportional to the inverse of the semi-major axis. On the previous slide, I derived the equation E equals minus GMM over 2A. An elliptical orbit is analogous to sending an object out from the surface of the Earth to the apoapsis point, and from there it travels back. 
The only reason it stops is because it collides with the Earth. If the Earth were a point mass, the object would travel to the periapsis point and then drift back to the apoapsis point. The energy here is negative because this is a bound orbit. If you increase the semi-major axis, then you increase the energy. It's like sending an object out to this point where the red star is. It would take more energy to get to the red star in the outer orbit than it would to get to the apoapsis point in the inner orbit. For the outer orbit, E2 is greater than E1, and since they are both negative numbers, the absolute value of E2 is less than E1. Another way of saying that is E2 is closer to zero than E1. Thus, energy is proportional to the negative of one over the semi-major axis. Imagine this is an unbound orbit, either a parabola or a hyperbola. This is kind of like saying the semi-major axis is infinite. Like I said on the previous slide, that isn't really the case, but it makes some sense. Here the energy is either zero for a parabolic trajectory or positive for hyperbola. When the eccentricity of an ellipse approaches one, it opens up when the eccentricity actually gets to one. And likewise, when the semi-major axis increases to infinity, an ellipse will open up when the semi-major axis gets to infinity. So I want to go back to Kepler's third law. Um, that's where he stated that the square of the period of the orbit of a planet is proportional to the cube of the length of its semi-major axis. That's expressed mathematically as t the period squared is equal to k, some constant, times a, the semi-major axis cubed. Uh, k is constant for all the planets that orbit around the sun, its central body. So somehow the sun had the power to govern a planet's motion, and its motion is based on distance. So the second law states, Kepler's second law states that the um, radius vector from the sun to a planet sweeps out equal areas in equal time. And I expressed that earlier as the change in area dA dt equals the angular momentum L over 2m, twice the mass. If I integrate dA from uh, t equals 0, to t equals capital T, the period, I get A, the total area of the ellipse. Here I'm substituting L over 2m for dA dt. That integral is trivial since L and m are constant. I simply evaluate L over 2m from 0 to t. That equals L over 2m t plus L over 2m times 0. And that equals t times L over 2m. A thus equals t times L over 2m. If I solve for t, I get t equals 2m over L times a. Here I'll square both sides. The area of an ellipse is pi times a times b, where a is the semi-major axis and b is the semi-minor axis. And then I showed you a proof of that in part 21. I'll make that substitution here. And then you'll recall also, I showed you earlier, earlier that b squared equals a squared times 1 minus c e squared. And I can make that substitution. And then recall that L squared over GM squared M equals A times 1 minus C squared. And I can make that substitution. Here I've grouped all the constants. The M squared terms canceled, and so do the L squared terms. T squared thus equals 4 pi squared A cubed over GM. And this is Kepler's third law. T squared is proportional to A cubed. Everything else is constant. The constant proportionality, k, is 4 pi squared over gm, and it depends only on the mass of the central body and therefore is the same for all planets. Kepler's third law is a consequence of Newton's universal law of gravity and Newton's laws of motion. It holds not only for planetary orbits, but also for orbits around anything, really. Recall the gravitational parameter is g times m. So I can simplify the equation for the period squared to 4 pi squared a cubed over mu. And recall that I showed in section 21 that mu equals 4 pi squared r cubed over t squared in the case of uniform circular motion. If I substitute that value for mu in the equation for t squared, I get that t squared equals t squared. So in the previous case, I computed this version of mu based on circular motion. Now I've done it for um, an elliptical orbit. And I get that result if I solve for this equation mu, hence t squared equals 4 pi squared a cubed over mu.
So I want to go back to a concept that I talked to you about uh, several slides earlier about apparent parabolic motion. The diagram on the right shows an initial velocity vector that would have resulted in what Galileo thought was parabolic motion. And then the um, angle theta is the angle, the velocity, angle of velocity vector from vertical. So here is the formula for angular momentum. L is mvr times the sine of theta. And then this is the formula for energy, 1 half mv squared minus g mm over r. Then I derive this formula for eccentricity. If I substitute for E and L in this equation, I get this. And then I can combine the little m's. And notice that m cube is in both the numerator and denominator, so those will cancel. And in this case, the velocity v is um, hundreds of meters per second at most. One half mv squared would be something like 10 to the fourth. Um, on the other hand, gmm over r is more like 10 to the seventh, which means uh, to estimate this, I can ignore the uh, one half v squared term. And so that results in this equation, and that simplifies to this. And this equation indicates the eccentricity is less than one, which means the path is part of an ellipse. So if the Earth were not in the way, the object would travel in elliptical orbit around the center of mass of the Earth. And then if you were to plug in 100 meters per second for the velocity, this eccentricity would be very close to one. And eccentricity of one is indeed a parabola. In this case, however, the path you'd observe if you'd be measuring carefully, is the top of an ellipse. So while it's nearly parabolic, it's not exactly. So Galileo was nearly was nearly right. And the last thing I want to talk to you about is there's um, in doing these simulations, there's something you need to watch out for. Um, it's an odd contradiction that uh, just has to do with the math. So here's the equation for energy. Let's say a moving object's following a hyperbolic path. Um, the total energy would be greater than zero, like we talked about. But what if in your simulation, R gets really, really small, if it gets close to the um, center of mass of the point mass? If I take the limit as R approaches zero, the potential energy actually goes to infinity. So the total energy would have started out as a constant, but then mysteriously it would have increased to infinity. So if you watch in this video, I wasn't careful, and all of a sudden, the velocity probably exceeded the speed of light. And there's no external force acting on this system, so this can't happen. It's hypothetical because mathematically, I considered these uh, massive bodies to be point masses. Um, and the animation on the right shows the proper way to do this where what happens in reality is when masses get close to each other, they coalesce, I mean, they literally crash into each other, but then they coalesce into one bigger mass. So when you're doing simulations like this, you've got to be careful when the uh, two point masses get close to each other, because you, you can get um, a change in energy, which isn't how things work in the physical world. I want to show you a simulation using vPython that demonstrate some of what I've showed you. I'm going to create a new program. I'm going to call it two body with energy. And I'm going to create an animation of two orbiting bodies, um, much like I did in the previous part. So this sets up the uh, scene canvas. And this is the gravitational constant. And I want to set up a sun sphere and an earth sphere. And I'm going to make these the same size. It's the relative motions that are important. So the radius is 3e9 for both. And notice the earth position. That's notionally where the earth would be. That's the sun's mass. Some velocity vector will be zero. And momentum is velocity times mass. This is the Earth mass. I'm setting up an initial Earth velocity vector. So the Earth will start at the position at Earth POS and have that initial velocity and then 
Earth momentum is Earth velocity times Earth mass. And then this is the center of gravity or the center of mass. So it'll be a white sphere and it'll be smaller than the Earth and Sun. And the position will be um, part of the center of mass equation. Sun position times sun mass plus the Earth's position times Earth mass divided by sun mass plus Earth mass. And I'm going to set the center velocity to zero. Okay, and again, Earth will start out at that position with that initial velocity, Earth V. Now, this is the distance from the sun to the earth and the distance from the earth to the sun. So sun dot r is sun position minus earth position. Earth dot r is the opposite. So two identical like vectors pointing in different directions. And then this is angular momentum, which I showed you in a previous part. It's mass times the cross product of r and v, or mass times r cross v. And the gravitational force, given the position that I set, is g earth mass sun mass times the r unit vector divided by the magnitude of r squared. So remember that r here is a vector. So if I want to know the distance to r, I have to use that mag function. Otherwise, it's a three-dimensional quantity. The kinetic energy for the sun is 1 half sun mass times sun velocity squared. And initially, this is zero because I set it to zero. The Earth um, kinetic energy is one half Earth mass times Earth velocity squared, and that is the magnitude of the Earth velocity vector squared. And I set the Earth velocity vector above. And then sun potential energy is um, g times sun n times Earth m divided by the magnitude of sun r and likewise Earth potential energy. So these potential energies are with respect to each other, whereas what I showed you previously, all the potential energy was with respect to the sun. Sun total energy is sun kinetic plus sun potential, and likewise Earth total energy is Earth kinetic plus Earth potential energies. And then I want to be able to display this, so I'm going to use a uh, time label, and I'll fill that in when I get into the animation loop. All right, the delta time is going to be 1e4, so that's 10,000. And then I want a counter so this animation loop doesn't run infinitely. So as long as the counter is greater than zero, I want to run it at a rate of 200. So this kind of guarantees that the animation is at the same rate no matter what computer you run it on. I'm going to decrement the time counter. And so you can see when it gets down to zero, it'll stop looping. And then the Earth momentum is the previous Earth momentum plus the Earth force times the delta time. And that's a straight line approximation. of. So that gives me the new momentum given the old momentum and the uh, current force. And then Earth velocity is just momentum divided by mass because momentum is um, mass times velocity. And then the new Earth position will be the old Earth position plus Earth velocity times delta time. And again, that's a straight line approximation. So given that initial position, I'm going to take that and add velocity times time. And that Earth dot V is a velocity vector. So I end up with a new Earth position vector, which is a three-dimensional quantity. And I'm going to do the same thing with sun, compute sun momentum, sun velocity, and sun position. So initially, sun velocity and momentum was zero, but after this loops a few times, there'll be some sun velocity and some momentum because the Earth and the sun co-orbit. All right, so then if I change the positions, then sun R and Earth R will change, and this orbit's gonna be somewhat elliptical, so R is not constant. And then I'll recompute the angular momentum, mass times R cross V for sun and Earth. And then I want to recompute the force. Um, given that I have new position and new r's, the force, which is gmm r hat over r squared, is going to be different. 
And that makes sense because as the planet, as the Earth goes through its elliptical orbit, the uh, force is going to change. And then I need to recompute kinetic energy, potential energy, and in theory, total energy should be constant. And I'll do the same thing for the sun, recompute kinetic, potential, and total energy. And then I want to recompute the center. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the uh, the center of mass is going to move. I showed you before it moves at a constant velocity. So I take the current center position and then I subtract the new position, which is position times mass plus position times mass divided by the sum of the masses. And then I want to actually update the position. So I need to do the velocity before I update the position. Otherwise, the difference would be zero. And this will give me the velocity at the center. And then that time label I set up is going to be set here. So I set total energy there. And that is a formatting function, so I don't get like 10 digits after the decimal point. There's Earth kinetic energy, and there's Earth potential energy, and then there's the angular momentum. OK, so this is a notional Earth orbit. I forget when the epoch is, but at some point a couple years ago, this is notionally how the Earth orbited. So you can see angular momentum is constant, but look closely at total energy. It's nearly constant, but it's not constant. Now, we don't expect kinetic and potential energy to be constant. That would only be the case if it were a perfectly circular orbit, which is hard to achieve. But the sum should be constant. Now, if I go in here and if I multiply the Earth's velocity vector times 1.25, it essentially increases the magnitude. And so this isn't a representative Earth orbit, but this creates a more elliptical orbit. And now notice the total energy is changing pretty significantly. So all the formulas and equations I showed you assume a fixed central mass and a smaller body orbiting around a much larger fixed central mass. Well, in reality, when I talked to you about the n-body problem, the Sun and the Earth co-orbit each other around a common very center. And so there is no fixed central mass. And the orbits, there is no such thing as a perfectly elliptical orbit. An elliptical orbit is a good approximation. And that's the only case where energy would be constant. So all these formulas I showed you um, had some underlying, underlying assumptions. All right, now what if I increase the mass of the Earth to about half the mass of the Sun, or not quite half? Now these are going to really co-orbit each other, and you can now see the white center of mass. And look at the energy. It's all over the place. And so in reality, if you have a two-body problem, um, again, if you have a very large central body, the uh, smaller body is going to look elliptical. But if the two masses relative to each other are comparable, you know, similar order of magnitude, you're going to get this odd two-body problem motion. And then these equations for energy don't hold. In fact, even angular momentum isn't constant. But if you notice what was constant was the center of mass velocity. And given a constant velocity for the center of mass, um, in that case, the energy is constant. Um, and there is no external acceleration affecting this two-body system. So the purpose of this was to put all the, the math and the calculus I did for you in context. The main takeaways from this part are all the math that I showed you that went into accounting for um, dynamics in a, in a gravitational field where acceleration is variable, depending on the distance from the center. But also, more importantly, the fundamental relationship between energy and eccentricity, which means um, there's a relation between energy and the shape of a trajectory or an orbit.